Um, the question of Palestine is one that connects virtually every struggle that concerns us. Anti-racism, feminism, anti-colonialism, queer and trans liberation, environmental justice, housing justice, anti-colonialism, Jewish struggle, Islamophobia, labor rights, I could go on. Essentially, Palestine represents freedom and justice for us all. It's why the protest chant uh, from within our lifetime goes, in our millions, in our billions, we are all Palestinians, because I think we're all sort of collectively waking up from a psychosis um, and the ways that our elected officials aren't actually representing us, period. So due to this overwhelming intersection, due to the overwhelming intersections of the Palestinian struggle, there are many ways that we can organize ourselves and apply pressure. The goal, after all, is to overwhelm every avenue um, and uh, means at our disposal to force the state to reckon with the loud call for Palestinian freedom so that they can't ignore us. I'll give you a few examples. Um, if you're in the food industry, a waiter, a chef, food critic, what have you, Israel has long appropriated our cuisine, claiming it as their own. Here in Philly, there has been a recent battle between Palestinian protesters and Mike Solomonov, an Israeli chef that um, has raised over $100,000 for the Israeli occupation forces. So protesters stood in front of his restaurant for literally three minutes protesting him, and it became a national story with even Joe Biden and John Fetterman um, condemning us. But um, of course, we've been called anti-Semitic and have been dragged through the dirt. But what it represents is that we can organize on that front. Uh, we can organize our workplaces, we can start unions, we can create the conditions that will allow for a work stoppage, a boycott, or demand that our owners openly support the call for liberation. Um, I remind you that Starbucks has lost over $12 billion in revenue since the beginning of the boycott due to the sort of principled organization of anti-Zionists. Um, if you're a cultural worker, a writer, an artist, a filmmaker, a musician, make art that will agitate people to action, action being the operative word here, um, do not waver on revolutionary political demands from Palestinian resistance, but beyond that, refuse to collaborate with Zionists, do not perform at their venues, do not publish with their outlets, pull your movies from film festivals like the Indo Independent Documentary Festival that saw several artists not attend, kill essays that have been heavily edited or censored. Um, for example, the most recent Art Forum magazine has been literally paper thin because dozens of contributors pulled their essays um, when the editor-in-chief was fired for his stance on Palestine, which was to be against genocide. Um, if you're a journalist, I think it speaks for itself. Tell the truth, scrutinize, critique. Do not at all take at face value the information that the Israeli state provides us with. They lie. That's what they do best. So be a journalist and tell the truth. Take risks. Provide space for anti-Zionists and Palestinians to analyze the horrific conditions in Gaza and don't speak over them. Um, if you're a cop, quit your job. If you work in philanthropy, um, cut checks. We um, Palestinian organizations need money um, and a lot of foundations have turned their back. So there are people like uh, Nancy and Maureen that are doing incredible work with Eyewitness Palestine. Within our lifetime, Palestinian Youth Movement, National SJP, uh, Dream Defenders and so on, um, do not act with the logic of scarcity but abundance. If you stand for justice, the time is to act now. If you're a parent educator, speak to your children, your students, um, support SJPs that are being repressed. Most recently, Rutgers, um, the first public university to ban their SJP. Lawyers provide know your rights trainings. Sue, if you're a doctor, recognize that the war against Gaza is a war against hospitals. Your Hippocratic Oath compels you to speak out against the genocide. Now, alone, these actions might not amount to much, but in concert with one another, we ensure that the question of Palestine demands an answer. Um, but what all of these things have in common is organization. So join your local organization, your within our lifetimes, your dream defenders, your existence as resistances, um, build trust with each other, build relationships. Um, do not retract your statements of solidarity. The Zionist backlash will inevitably come. And it doesn't matter. The culture of fear only works if we let it work. Um, so yeah, organize. Like the protesters in the Bay Area that chained themselves together and threw their keys in the water didn't do so alone. They did so together. They had a whole apparatus from jail support and legal support. Um, I'm not saying you won't risk anything or sacrifice anything. That's part of the game, but nothing matters in relation to the relentless carpet bombing in Gaza. Um, 
And I end with a quote from our martyr de fête, Alarir, who said, I'm an academic. The toughest thing I have at home is an expo marker. But if the Israelis invade, I'm going to use that marker to throw it at the Israeli soldiers, even if it's the last thing that I would be able to do. So I ask you all to find your expo markers and find the things that create damage. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, and you guys can uh, Google up um, Nikki's full name in the chat. Um, he's done some really wonderful writings around this. Uh, so definitely read his work. Um, we appreciate you. Um, thank you for everything that you do. Um, next up, I would like to invite our sister uh, from Nabi Saleh, uh, currently in the West Bank, uh, Jenna Jihad. Um, hello, Nancy. I'm sorry, my camera's being weird right now. Just give me a second. You're good, Habib, too. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for organizing this webinar. And thank you um, for inviting me. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today and talking about Palestine and the action um, that you must do, that the, the steps that you must take in order um, to ensure uh, justice and equality here in Palestine. Um, I would want to start off talking a little bit about what is currently going on in Palestine from my personal experience here. And uh, I currently live in the West Bank. Um, if I want to talk a little bit about my daily experiences as a Palestinian student who is a 12th grader that goes every day to her school in Ramallah, which is the closest city to my village, Nabi Saleh. Um, Ramallah is literally 30 or 25 minutes away from Nabi Saleh. But since the beginning of the onslaught on Gaza, um, the Israeli occupation forces have closed most, if not all, um, uh, permanent checkpoints that are uh, put almost on every entrance of every Palestinian city, every Palestinian village, every Palestinian town. Um, every day I have to take a whole other route that takes me up to uh, two hours to get to my school. I'm usually late to my school. Um, a lot of students are unable to even reach their schools for days or weeks. Um, some have not came to school for a whole month uh, due to uh, the restrictions that we have on our movement. Uh, currently in the West Bank, uh, there are uh, uh, huge attacks that are being carried by the Israeli occupation forces, by the Israeli settlers, uh, under the protection of the Israeli occupation forces on Palestinian villages, Palestinian schools, um, Palestinian centers, Palestinian houses. Uh, currently, uh, Janine, our city, Janine is under attack. Um, uh, currently, uh, a continuous attack of the Israeli occupation forces who are literally destroying the city, bombing the city even, uh, killing uh, civilians and killing Palestinians, killing children and arresting children. Um, they're uh, talking about arrest. There's currently a huge ongoing campaign that is taking place in the West Bank and all over Palestine, even in Gaza, at the point at this point with the uh, on land attack, where there is um, literally hundreds of Palestinians that are being arrested every day. If I want to talk about um, my friend's village, uh, literally yesterday, uh, forty five Palestinians were arrested from one village in the West Bank. In the West Bank. Um, uh, it's it's crazy in the West Bank, in Gaza, in all of historical Palestine. Uh, the the situation, the stories that I'm hearing from my friends and um the people that I know in Gaza are stories that are literally really hard to hear, really hard to narrate, really hard to explain. Uh, I have female friends that I've been uh, hardly in contact with, but the only stuff that I was able to get from them is that. Uh, uh, it's literally unlivable, unbearable to be there, especially as a woman. As a woman, I'm going to start talking about... Um the basic necessities we need uh, as women currently there are no um uh menstrual products in Gaza in the entirety of the the Gaza strip for okay. weeks women were not have not been able uh to access period or, or menstrual products they have not been able to access um literally any medication uh, almost from uh pharmacies even in hospitals there are over 55 um 
uh, uh, thousand Palestinian women that are currently uh, pregnant and are unable to get to hospitals, unable to seek the medical care and the medical attention that they need. Thousands of women are literally giving birth without a single uh, drug, without a single medication. Um, the the current situation in in all of Palestine is is one that is unbearable and unlivable. Life under occupation is one that is abnormal, and we must never normalize um, such life. And uh, I mean, at, during the beginning of the war, uh, actually a, a day before um, the the war has started, um, I uh, had a speaking tour in the UK and I left Palestine on October 6th. Um, when I was in the airport, I got the news that uh, Gaza was being under attack and uh, I had speeches uh, all over the UK and it was extremely surprising to see the narrative, the narrative that is being told, um, the narrative that is believed by uh, almost a lot of people all over the Western world. Um, the way that the, the reality is being... Um, objectified the way that the news are being uh, literally told and the narrative that is being spread all over um, the world about Palestinians is is just crazy. And uh, if we want to talk about the things that we as Palestinians, we as interna the international community, we as uh, the people who believe that uh, justice is one that should not be um, taken away from anyone in the world, we must take Action. Um, it is really crucial to stop, um, flip the narrative. Simply talk about uh, colonialism. Talk about capitalism. Talk about, as Nikki said, um, the shared struggles. Connect our struggles because, as a Palestinian living in Palestine, who is currently um, the population of my uh, people are my people are literally being ethnically cleansed. This uh, struggle and my issue is one that should not be separated from your issue as uh, black Americans facing police brutality or people of color facing capitalist systems and forms of colonization, forms of poverty, forms of um, uh, injustices. Any form of injustice is one that is stemmed from a single system which we might all um uh unite in order to to fight in order to resist in order to abolish um and here we we call on you to take the necessary steps and by necessary steps i don't mean you steps a necessary step is the tiny steps a necessary step is the step that uh you you can do based on your ability based on what you what you have from resources based on if it's simply something as simple as posting something on social media but it is crucial for us because it is crucial to raise awareness it is crucial to speak up and it is crucial to tell the world the truth tell it as it is tell tell the world what is currently going on and literally stand up against these injustices because what is this world that we're going to live in if it's a world that um uh, accepts genocide if it's a world that accepts um the killing and murdering of people just because they are people of color just because we are palestinians because we're not white um uh, i think we need to reevaluate our moral values we we must uh, reevaluate our values, our morals, our ideologies, and stand up against all these forms of injustices. Um, we must always uh, call on uh, everyone to stand up against oppression. We must we must look at the d deeper issues, and we must fight colonialism as a whole. And I'm not telling you that because it is something that I want you to do, or it is something that you are doing me as a Palestinian a favor, but it is, if anything, your responsibility as a human. Because if, if we allow this to happen in Palestine, you are next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Habibdi. Thank you, Jenna. Um, please, folks, if you have questions, you can throw them in the chat and we will get to them during our Q&A um, after we get through the rest of our wonderful speakers. Next up, I want to um, invite our wonderful brother doing uh, doing some real uh, positive, amazing, hard work. Um, some of you know him, and if you don't, where have you been? <laughs> 
Shout out to my brother Ahmed Abu Znid from the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights. Hey, thank you, Nancy. Much appreciated to you and the Eyewitness Palestine team. And shout out to the panelists. I love being in good space with good people. It's truly nourishing. Um, it's affirming and it's helpful for us to be able to engage in this long-term work of revolution. My name is Ahmed Abu Znaid. I am um, Palestinian, born in East Jerusalem, but I'm Khalili. Um, my father's family is from Dura al-Khalil and my mother's side of the family is from al-Khalil. And I had the opportunity to live um, in the occupied West Bank as a child in East Jerusalem and in al-Khalil. I think that shaped a lot of the way I've shown up in the United States. And I really love what Jenna was um, hitting at there for all of us here is that, you know, this is a moment for us to knock down these walls that they've built between us. You know, this divide and conquer tactic that have served to sever our movements, silo our movements for decades, if not hundreds of years. Um, we need to topple these divisions uh, and make sure we unite. So I really just wanted to affirm, you know, what Jenna was leading with. Um, I'm at the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, and I'm the executive director right now. And we are a organization about 20 years old, founded for the specific purpose of ending all U.S. military aid to support uh, to the state of Israel. Right. We want to eliminate that aid. And, and our theory of change is we know that as U.S. taxpayers, um, as U.S. voters, as U.S. citizens, um, we're actually actively complicit. We're active in the oppression of the Palestinian people. Um, we're active in supporting the colonial structures of the state of Israel with arms, with money, with diplomatic support. And so the biggest value add that we have here even though I'm a Palestinian, what I can tell you is those of us here contribute so much to the suffering that we can also contribute down the line to the liberation. And that's simply by removing the boot off the Palestinian people's neck, um, right? That boot is paid for, financed, and armed um, by our government. So that's our role for me when I assess the U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights and those who've been a part of this movement is how do we get the U.S. to stop being so fucking terrible and imperialist, um, beginning with Palestine for us, for our cause. But of course, like we see in our connection to other movements, right, like the need for an anti-war movement that could could have better addressed the war in Iraq, the be better addressed the war in Afghanistan. So we know that the U.S. and its foreign policy and imperialism has been a part of this country's uh, roots, uh, right, going back. Uh, decades. And we understand that in order for that to actually be affected and impacted, we really need a mass movement. And I'll, I'm here to say that, like, actually, what we're seeing in this moment right now is probably the biggest we've ever seen our movement. Um, the grassroots are truly united behind Palestine. This is the most diverse and broad based support I believe we've ever seen in the US. Um, this is important for us to acknowledge because even though we haven't accomplished our goals yet, right, we haven't gotten to an ending of military funding to the state of Israel. We haven't seen a liberated Palestine yet, but we have to take stock of our gains. This is essential for us as a movement to see the improvements we've made. This gives us hope, this gives us energy, this allows for us to stay focused on a long-term goal of liberation. You know, and this movement uh, is inspired by the resilience and the steadfastness of the Palestinian people on the ground. Of course, the people in Gaza, the folks in the West Bank, the folks in Nabi Saleh, the folks in Al-Khalil, the folks in Janine, you name it. Uh, and that's why we also see a fearlessness uh, from folks in this movement in the U.S., right? Because we've seen repression. We've seen folks get fired. We won't stop. They've seen job offers pulled. We won't stop. They can defame us and call us anti-Semites. We won't stop. The resistance to Israel's colonization of Palestine is abundant, and it's represented all across the globe. I'll share a couple of words of kind of what we've been up to uh, with the U.S. campaign and kind of where we see the uh, the interventions being necessary, and then I'd love to just yield the rest of my time and get into a conversation. The U.S. campaign has been uh, really, really uh, fortunate to be leading on a lot of the congressional advocacy. And we understand, of course, what bo the body of Congress consists of uh, and what U.S. foreign policy 
has consisted of historically. With that being said, again, as taxpayers, as voters, uh, as citizens, it's clear that we have to make allowed um, our opposition to the genocide. And so we've been able to gen generate over 800,000 letters to members of Congress. We've been able to, to generate uh, over 100,000 uh, calls to members of Congress. And that's because of folks like you all that are joining us today and so many more. Um, so we want to continue to keep the pressure on Congress because that's who passes the budget. That's who, in, you know, passes and sets this policy. Of course, we've been a, pa uh, a part of all the protests, not all the protests, but protests and rallies and marches across the country, including, of course, that massive rally uh, on November 4th in D.C., where we had over 500,000 people. Uh, this is critical to, to building the mass movement, to getting our narrative out there, uh, to connecting with people, to giving an opportunity for folks who aren't already involved, that opportunity to be involved. There's a lot of direct action and civil, civil disobedience, and this is critical. People putting their bodies on the line, risking arrest, uh, thinking about different tactics uh, that we don't typically see in order to, again, continue to shift and change hearts and minds. We need to boycott and disrupt the economy. You know, the BDS movement has cl clearly been critical. Uh, you've seen Puma just recently uh, announce, you know, their withdrawal from supporting the Israel national team. This is a campaign that's been worked on for years. We've seen other campaigns like Ben and Jerry's, for instance. So we want to continue to boycott. And when you talk about disrupting the economy, of course, it's not just the boycotts. I think Nikki was talking about unions and strikes and workers' power. And this is critical to not just freedom for Palestine, but what we want to see here domestically in the U.S., right? when we know that domestically we're also getting the short end of the stick so that they can fund war and oppression abroad. The last thing I'll note is just we got to we got to continue to shift the narrative, you know, so op-eds, interviews, but if you know if you don't have those platforms through traditional media, social media, you know, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, X, whatever you name them, They've been critical for folks to be able to shed light on the Palestinian uh, narrative, the Palestinian voice, the Palestinian position, and we have to continue to affect change in that way as well. Thank you, Nancy. I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you, brother. We appreciate you. Ahmed Abazanaid, please follow the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights. They have been doing some really amazing work and they have been mobilizing um, and, uh, you know, definitely support their work. Um, like Nikki said, like Palestinian organizations, um, now is definitely the time um, to support um, and uplift us because we are putting, you know, we put everything into this anyway. So you can only imagine now um, how um, urgent it is to support organizations like ourselves. Um, I will put our uh, link again into the chat for everybody as well. Eyewitness Palestine, please do support our work. Um, Next up, I want to invite the person that is my claim to fame, if nobody knows what I've ever done in my life. <laughs> but when you say Nancy Mansour, um, you know, I'm not Nancy Mansour without my beautiful sister, Shadia Mansour, who is joining us from London today. Uh, so I invite uh, artist uh, Shadia Mansour. Shadi, I think you're muted still. So. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry, I, I was saying that thank you for having me, first of all. Um, and thank you for everyone, all the panelists here, for being here today. I mean, it goes without saying um, that, you know, I consider everyone here my equals and uh, who I respect a lot in the movement. And... Um, yeah, I, I, I really wanted to just quickly um, kind of um, share with people, you know, the, I guess, a couple of strategies maybe um, that can maybe uh, help people get back on track who are watching, who, especially the people that have reached out to me personally, um, to tell me that they feel powerless, um, especially because of the UN ceasefire failing um which obviously we you know no one especially me i've been very vocal about how i you know i have no confidence in uh, the united nations we know what the united nations is they gave away palestine they partitioned um palestine and the middle east and we know what they're all about but nonetheless they need to have you know we expected that um the international you know the voices of millions of people would shake their seats a little bit. Um, and 
since they're the people in power that can make a difference, we people were optimistic, I feel, um, about, you know, um, this happening. So a lot of people reached out to me personally to say they just feel, you know, powerless and, and what can they do and how can they help? And, um, and you know, I, I think that being that it's been proven that direct action has been the only thing that's never let us down. It's never let any any like movement that has been fighting um, colonial uh, um, governments and imperialism. It's never let us down. And um, I'm talking about you know, there's people that can't physically support direct actions. They can't actually. They're not able to do so. Some people are just not built like that. Um, you know, there's some people that just can't get arrested. I don't know what the reason may be, but that's fine. Everyone can do their part. Um, but, you know, we have to support them. If people can't directly be involved, then directly support. Palestine Action US, uh, UK and the USA have been outside every day. They've been really shutting things down. Um, and I know people have that have been, you know, kind of paying attention. They know that recently corporations have had to cut ties with LB um, systems in the UK that are the main, uh, one of the main uh, weapons manufacturers that are basically slaughtering Palestinians and uh, also behind, you know, uh, the, the bloodshed and the 18,000 plus, if not up to 20,000, I've been hearing also um, slaughtered Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank as well. That's, that's not the death toll, um, including the West Bank of children. I mean, mainly children we're talking about in the West Bank as well, in Jenin, Balata. Um, so, um, yeah, that type of action needs to be supported. They have to get, I feel like they really need to get more um, uh, voices publicly, verbally supporting them, you know. Um, they need to be, you know, I feel like there was a time where even BDS wasn't publicly supported um, because it's not... You know some some of these uh i don't know uh politically correct people want to you know kind of stay out of the whole uh uh physical uh, direct action uh strategy but i don't agree with that i feel like um, that's what's kept us back that's what's held us back um and again i'll say it again these are the only actions that have never let us down these are this is people power that has been proven to work um, I mean, look at Puma, like uh, my brother Ahmed Abuznid mentioned earlier, Puma. Um, this is not the first time, by the way. I mean, Puma's been, they've been boycotted for a while now. For And this is the first time Puma has really had to, um, uh, you know, retract um, and, and basically uh, retreat. And, uh, and I think it's, this is one of the things, I mean, consistency, you know, the BDS has been consistent. And also I have to make it really, really clear. It's Palestinian led. It's so important to me personally. Uh, I've, I've never been a fan of people who especially consider themselves allies of um, the Palestinian plight, telling me how to resist, telling me how to protest, telling me how to express myself. Because I think it's important that Palestinians um, are in control of the narrative when it comes to the self-representation and representation of our community and our culture and our political history and our geographical history as well. Um, so, yeah, I think that um, it's work, it's proven to work. BDS in particular is proven to work. I mean, BDS isn't just boycott, divest, sanction. BDS is saying no to normalization, saying no to people that tell you Oh, don't use the word martyr. No, we use the word martyr, shuhada. This is what this is our language. This is what we need to be in control. This is what my point about being in control of the narrative. We need to show people how people who are allies, who are not Palestinian in particular, how to resist for us. You know what I'm saying? Besides us resisting for us, uh, uh, resisting the occupation for our own people in Palestine and in in the diaspora, but this is just an example because, you know, I recently was told by a friend of mine that someone, you know, uh, who's basically an ally was telling her, oh, no, you know, when you get up on stage, you be careful what type of words to use. No, we don't. We're not going to censor ourselves. I never have personally censored myself, but we need to get out. We need to put the pressure on that, too, on, on the kind of like, you know, the, the censorship 
of uh, how we represent ourselves because there's still some of that. Um, so it's just so many levels to it. Um, it's uh, you know if if people uh, if people want to want to talk about you know um, uh, self representation and you know you gotta and you're an ally you gotta learn from the people who you're who you're basically an ally with in in allyship with you know you, you really have to learn from, you have to listen to people this is what being a good ally is um, so yeah as I said BDS um, direct action for me personally is my first uh, you know um, recommendation and um, you know uh, I, I think that basically um, putting the pressure on corporations who have been funding Israel. I mean, these are these are not just it's not just a brand name. These are people behind these corporations, CEOs who are making the decision like Sp Steven Spielberg, who we've just you know, discovered is a super ultra ultra um, child killer um, advocate of, uh, of Israel, you know, and um, and he's uh, you know, we know that he's been um, advocating for and funding the IDF, him and his wife. And uh, and basically, um, you know, sponsoring and sanction and and, and um, you know, funding the the killing of eight thousand to ten thousand children in Gaza and the children who are being murdered in in the West Bank. Um, so putting the pressure on these corporations is putting the pressure on the pockets of the CEOs of those corporations, um, because Israel is only holding itself up, is only surviving the the the, the you know the blood that's being pumped into I mean, let, let me not use the word blood, but I'll say, um, you know, the, the, I guess the pulse that's, you know, uh, that Israel survives by is basically these CEOs that are funding them. And so when we put, when we close a tap on these uh, CEOs, there's no funding for Israel. And then the occupation self-destructs slowly, slowly. And we've been seeing it self-destruct, obviously, by these TikTok videos that they've been putting out. These people that are coming, you know, doing these stupid TikTok videos. There's no point even reacting because they're literally self-destructing. They are, they are completely like they have, they run out of ways to, to lie. They run out of lies. They run out of fabrications. So they're now they're making that, they're making fun of themselves, basically, um, because they're complete clowns. And, you know, um, it's a clown show. And uh, this is us watching Israel self-destruct um, financially and, uh, you know, um, economically and, uh, and politically. So anyway, I'll just wrap it up by saying, um, you know, we have to stay firm. We have to stay consistent and um, supporting the people outside, the people on the ground. Um, and direct action, again, is the only action I per personally believe that's never let us down. And we should continue to support these uh, movements. And God protect you too. Sorry, Thank you. you want to translate that, Nancy? I'm on. Yeah, she said, um, God have mercy on all of our martyrs um, in Gaza, the West Bank, and all of our martyrs throughout the history of our uh, people. Um, and uh, God protect our people that are uh, uh, resisting this occupation. Thank you, Habib, to appreciate you. Um, just to um, kind of reiterate what Shadi was saying about direct action as well. Um, you know, it's kind of like if you see somebody attacking somebody in the street, there's this uh, natural um, kind of will to jump in or to say something, right? There's those people that will you know, physically jump in to stop someone fighting. Um, and there were there are the people that will stand there and at least say something. Um, and so that's how it works with direct action. These are people putting their bodies on the line saying, stop killing Palestinians, stop sending these weapons. You are making, you are manufacturing uh, weapons to kill Palestinians. Not just that, but they're testing illegal weapons on Palestinians. I don't know. It's like there's so much happening that I don't know how much people get um, how much information people get a hold of, but there are illegal weapons that Israel is testing on Palestinians time and time again. And every time that they've bombed them, I don't know how many times this year they bombed uh, Gaza, not just uh, since October uh, 7th, but they have bombed Gaza, uh, you know, I mean, I would say almost every few days. 
Um, and there are always weapons being tested. And uh, this is something uh, very important to note because then what they do is they have a conference. In 2014, I remember they had a, um, a conference right after uh, the 2014 um, uh, massacre uh, in Gaza, and they were selling these this new weaponry that they had. And actually a friend of mine, Dan Cohen, um, went in and did a report from inside of that conference and they were laughing about testing it uh, in Gaza and how it worked. Um, and so these people putting their bodies on the line, um, I know a lot of people just kind of skip over and they're like, oh, that's cool. But they actually need our support um, because what they're doing is right. And they have, you know, they they have the means, I guess they have the, uh, well, I wouldn't say the means, but um, they are putting their bodies on the line. And so we need to at least uh, uplift their voices, support them, share the videos, sharing stuff definitely helps. Um, you know, when the content that Shadia was talking about, Israel's creating these videos, um, that some of them are absolutely, actually most of them are absolutely ridiculous. Uh, but, you know, there, I've literally watched people in debates over the past couple of months, and I mean my whole life, but the, the past couple of months of them saying, oh, that's not real, that's not real. There's, there's, apps that you can run videos through and see if it's AI generated. You can see whether it's real. They did this, um, they uh, they did this um, a million times where they've said that video isn't real, um, that video isn't real. And you can literally run these videos through AI apps and see that these videos are 100% real. Not to mention the fact that a lot of these videos um, are passed through, you know, are, are literally being put out live, like journalists, uh, young people in Gaza that are filming this live real time for you to see what is happening. And I'm sorry, I was going to say when they've said it's not real, for example, Muhammad al-Durra, Allah yirhamu, if anybody ever remembers that video of the little boy from Gaza that was laying on his dad's lap and his dad's waving a white flag and they shot him 50 times. Um, on his father's lap, they tried to say that video was not real. And in 2023, had that been now, you can run that video through and see that that is real. And these videos that are coming out of Ghazi of little kids picking up their, their siblings' bodies and putting them into backpacks, they're real. And so keep sharing that information. Um, when people question it, there are apps available for you to check whether that information is real. Um, also, language. Language is very important. People keep calling this a war. A war would uh, need two armies. Um, and so I, I think it's important to say that, you know, uh, I, I believe Palestinian resistance fighters do not have one vehicle, uh, you know, not one tank, not one jeep. And they are on foot in uh, flip flops um, fighting the fourth strongest military in the world. Uh, and when we talk about Palestinians being slaughtered, this genocide that is happening, it's also important to uplift our men, our men that are protecting our people on the ground there. Um, you know, they are humans. They're my, my, you know, my, they're our fathers, they're our brothers, they're our sons, they're our uncles, they're our cousins. These are our people also, and their lives are not cheap. And so when we talk about Palestinians, let's talk about them as a whole and uplift our men. And talking of amazing Palestinian men, uh, it must run in his family. <laughs> Next up, we have a Palestinian activist, life coach, business coach, and also the son of um, our amazing Palestinian brother who is serving five consecutive life sentences um, in Israeli dungeons, uh, Marwan Barghouti, uh, the son of Marwan uh, Arab Barghouti. Thank you, thank you, Nancy, and thank you for the other speakers. Uh, to start with, I think uh, that. Uh, I just want to thank everyone that spoke because they have covered everything that uh, you guys can do, uh, basically. But uh, I, I just want to shed the light that, you know, we Palestinians uh, feel uh, we're alone and we're dying quietly when we don't feel that we're getting the support uh, all over the world. And this, this has been uh, the fact for many, many years because our suffering has been normalized to the point where we lost hope. Um, we, we lost hope that anyone will come and rescue us. And we lost hope to the point where we felt that um, armed resistance, violence is the only way that the world can hear us because we've been begging, literally begging for the people, for the whole world to, to hear us and to listen to us and to uh, see what we're going through. Since 1948, um, we have a generation, basically a generational trauma that we're going through 
generation after generation. In 1948, the massacres. In the 50s, we had massacres. In the 67, we had massacres of the Palestinian people and uh, the, the full control of the whole land. And um, in, in, in the 70s, in the 80s, the second, uh, the, the first Intifada and the Oslo Accords, which is the first uh, attempt to uh, have a political resolution for uh, the whole cause. And even though we knew that it was an unjust uh, resolution, we accepted that because we, we just wanted to live our lives. Uh, we didn't want to be heroes anymore. Uh, we've done that for decades, and uh, the only answer that we get is to get slaughtered and to get uh, uh, put in prison. Uh, in, in, um, I still remember when the Second Intifada uh, broke in uh, 2000, and my father happened to be one of the leaders of that Intifada. And um, it's very important to differentiate between hearing and sympathizing with oppression and between experiencing oppression. It's, it's very different to experience oppression yourself. It's much different when uh, you're 11 or 12 years old and the soldiers come to, come to your house, um, control the whole house, put you in a room with your whole family and stay there for days, put the Israeli flag on your uh, balcony and um, they they have you ask them for permission to go to the kitchen or to go to the uh, bathroom. This is something that I personally went through. And I'm considered as someone who, who went through something maybe average and uh, from a Palestinian experience. Because if, if I compare myself to what the Gazans are, are going through, it's, it's nothing, literally nothing. And I've had to endure that pain and live with that pain since the age of 12. And then when they started to look for my father, uh, more and more they put pressure on us and they started pressuring the family and pressuring um, everyone. I still remember the court when I went there and I got uh, attacked by Israeli uh, settlers in the court because they knew that I'm his son. I still remember the first time I visited him and uh, the fear that I've had being between soldiers because they prevented anyone from my family except myself to go there because I was the youngest. I was 13 years old, so they didn't uh, uh, mind that. And when I went to that uh, uh, room, he was isolated for three years. He didn't see anyone. Um, we had, uh, uh, you know, I, I couldn't touch him until now. I haven't touched him since 2002. And um, I, I still remember the soldiers on both sides, the cameras, the intimidation that they put on us. And in the, in the middle of that, I will never ever remember the, uh, the I will never uh, forget the, the best smile that I've ever seen in my life because that's exactly who he is. He's someone who uh, brings hope and uh, creates hope from nothing. And that taught me a lesson that even if you are the victim, as a Palestinian, you do not have the privilege to play the victim. Even if you're a victim and you know you are a victim, you don't have the privilege to complain about it. You can advocate about it, you can talk about it, but you need to be stronger the next day and you need to continue and you need to do uh, better than what you did uh, uh, the day before because you live with a chip on your shoulder that you're never going to uh, uh, have a normal life and you need to be okay with that because maybe uh, our children will, will have a better life than us. Because my father told me that when he was 18 years old, his, his dream was to, um, to, to have a free Palestine for his children. But the first thing that the interrogator did to him, because he was arrested at 15, he was arrested at 18, and this is a very normal life for any Palestinian. And uh, when he was interrogated at the age of 18, he still remembers and he wrote about the fact that the interrogator deliberately um, hit him and kicked him in the genitalia. And he told him explicitly that uh, a, a guy like you 
shouldn't bring any other terrorists to, terrorists to this world and shouldn't uh, be able to, to give birth to, to others. But here I am, and here is my my three siblings, and we um, we are not only loyal to the Palestinian cause; we would give anything to the Palestinian cause, and we feel that um, you know, even in the West Bank, and even going through this oppression, and even going through all of this, we still feel the guilt that we want to be under the rubble with our brothers and sisters in Gaza, because they don't deserve what's happening to them. And I, I, I truly think that we, um, we, we have to remind ourselves and you guys have to remind yourselves why you're supporting the Palestinian cause. You're not supporting the Palestinian cause because it's your cause only, because what it represents to you and the values that it represents. The Palestinian cause is not about Palestinians or Arabs or Muslims. It's about the oppressed people all over the world. And we need to make sure that everyone understands that you supporting the Palestinian cause is not only supporting Palestine, it's supporting the, pl the black people in America, it's supporting minorities all over the world, it's supporting uh, the, the uh, oppressed people, wherever they are, not only in Palestine. So Palestine is only a, a point that you can start in Congo, in Sudan, in Yemen, we're all like we need to globalize this movement and to stop to, uh, speaking about this race or that race, this religion or that religion. It's time for humanity to wake up and to understand that it's time for all of us to, um, uh, you know, be, be be together and to stop the madness of uh, the government and of uh, the the political leaders that are totally complicit in, in what's happening. It's very ironic to go through this experience and then when you talk to a German official or a Dutch official or, or someone from here or there, all they talk about is, uh, you know, October the 7th and uh, raping women and beheading babies and all these lies that uh, they use to justify the killing of innocent children of Palestinian innocent children. And I, we Palestinians know exactly what the Israelis are doing. We know that with the message that they are sending to us because they've sent that message over and over again, which is an Israeli life is worth a thousand lives of yours. And they proved that by prisoners exchange. They proved that by killing uh, uh, many, many, uh, uh, you know, Palestinians in exchange for the Israelis that got got uh, got killed. Because this is exactly who the Israeli government is. They are war criminals. Historically speaking, they have been war criminals. The the only thing now is that they got exposed finally, finally, and it's a relief. Unfortunately, it needs twenty thousand Palestinians to be slaughtered in their homes and for. Uh, uh, 60, 70,000 other, uh, others to, to, to get injured and for, for their lives to get changed forever and 85% per, uh, of the uh, Gazan population to be expelled from their homes and displaced for the world to wake up. That's what it needs. This is the world that we live in. But again, I want to remind myself that having people like you from all over the world, from different backgrounds, gives, gives me real hope uh, of change and to give you know some of the things that we can do to make real change is educating ourselves educating ourselves about the Palestinian cause and that the Palestinian cause is a just cause and I know that whenever you go into an argument with an Israeli or a, or a Zionist or a pro-Israeli they only uh, uh, want to put you in the corner and tell you that Hamas said this and Hamas charter, and they, they want to be very specific so you, they can put you in the corner where you, don't, you, you can't uh, uh, defend yourself. But our cause is not only about this detail or that detail. Our cause is way bigger than that. It's a cause for liberation. It's a cause for freedom. And we need to always remind ourselves of that. I think one of the biggest goals that we need to all uh, unite on is isolating the Israeli occupation. The only way to deal with Israel is to isolate Israel where they think, where they know and understand that the world doesn't 
uh, take their bullshit anymore. And uh, that we want, uh, and, and that the world is exposing their, their lies and lies because decade after decade, we felt betrayed by the world of, of believing their lies about us and, and putting us as, as the bad people and that we want to destroy the Israeli people and that we, we want the death for Jewish people and all of that. This is a sickness. We've never had any problem with the, with the Jewish people. We Palestinians are proud of the, of, of the Jewish history of, the, of Palestine. The only thing that killed our balance on this land that has been for centuries after centuries for the three religions and for all people and a, a very accepting land, th what killed the balance is the, the, the Zionist movement, not the Jewish people. We've never had any problem with our Jewish brothers and sisters, and we need to be very careful with that. And I know that they use that card, which is a very cheap card, but I'm so glad that finally they are getting exposed about that. Now, for what you can do, you can, of course, you know, donate money. Money is easy. Raise your voice. But when you raise your voice, be very careful not to focus on the polarity of, of, of the cause. Do not uh, uh, make the mistake of pushing people away of the Palestinian cause. If they're ignorant about the Palestinian cause, educate them. Do not push them away. Do not hate them. If they say that the Palestinians are terrorists, do not take it personal. It's okay. I've practiced my whole life to take that. I've practiced my whole life to have questions about my father being a terrorist and being a killer and all of that. And I know it's not true deep inside. So we need to work internally to make sure that we do not push people away the, to the, uh, uh, from the Palestinian cause. We need these people. We need their support. They're just ignorant about the, the whole situation. They're not bad people. If you go and talk to them, if you uh, uh, debate with them, if you make sure to give them the full picture, yes, some of them are going to be fanatics. We can't control that. But what we can control is that, let's say 20, 30% of the population are neutral or going towards the Israeli side because they think that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East and Israel is an amazing country and they have amazing startups and amazing people and that the Palestinian people are the bad ones who just want the eradication of the Israeli uh, people and all these lies and all of that. It's totally fine. Have the debate with them. Do not attack them. Do not shout at them. I've seen a lot of Palestinian young people and I I, I've I did my master's in the US. I know the student life in the US. And I, I really urge you not to push people away. Do not be aggressive with them. We need to be smart and clever about how we do things. We need to attract people into our cause so we can all isolate the Israeli government so they can change. And I really hope that the Israeli people are awake towards what's happening. But when you read the polls, you see that the Israeli people are totally, totally out of this world and be being totally brainwashed towards what's happening. And this is why you have only less than 2% that are saying that Israel needs to stop the war. And that's why you have 30, 40, 50% that are saying that Israel is not doing enough in Gaza. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine how, mu how, how much brainwash you need to have to say that the killing of children in, in their homes is wrong and we need to stop that? So you need to know who you're dealing with. And I'm not, uh, uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that they are bad people and we need to isolate them and all of that. But we need to understand where they're coming from. And where they're coming from, they're coming from a government that has been systematically working on them and brainwashing them since kindergarten until high school to tell them that the Palestinians are bad, to tell them that we didn't uh, uh, commit any massacres in 1948, to lie to them that the Palestinians came to Israel and the Palestinians are stealing the Israeli land and all this nonsense that everyone knows that it's wrong, but it's okay. We need to re-educate everyone that doesn't know about Palestine. We need to be relentless. We need to stop taking anything personal.
And this is very important if you really want to make and and uh, uh, have have real change. Boycotting is is the most powerful tool, and we need to learn from our brothers and sisters in South Africa and that model that has really made uh, a huge change by uh, uh, isolating the apartheid regime of South Africa. And you saw um, uh, the the difference that it made. I just want to say that I know it, it can be depressing uh, sometimes to hear the Israeli uh, narrative, to hear the Israeli um, lies, and to hear about the Zionists and how they victimize themselves. I know, I know that your emotions can boil, but we need to be stronger than that. And you are, I, I, I used to say, you are in the belly of the beast, so you have the leverage there, more than us in Palestine. You're the ones who have the most impact on the governments, the very governments that are supporting this genocide, that are complicit without the support of the US, without the support of the EU, the whole Zionist system, apartheid system will collapse. And you have that control. I know it doesn't seem that it's close, but trust me, talk to the Irish people, talk to the Algerian people, talk to the South African people. You will find that it's, it's it's changing sooner than later. And the last thing uh, I, I you know, want to say is to quote my dad when he wrote a few years ago, what is it with the arrogance of the occupier and the oppressor and their backers that makes them deaf to the simple truth? Our chains will be broken before we are because it's human nature to heed the call for freedom and regardless of the cost. Thank you. Thank you, Arab. Uh, man, I got it. You know, this is like a pure example of, of how much we love our people. Like the, you know, you always bring me to tears, honestly, I have to tell you, and I'm not, it's not easy for me to get emotional. Um, the last two months have been a bit easier. But when I hear you speak, and Jenna as well, Jenna Jihad, when they're speaking from Palestine, like imagine for us what we feel here and we're not in it, you know what I'm saying? And so when I hear them speak with strength and clarity um, and steadfastness, it just kind of re-energizes <laughs> re everything. And I'm like, yes, um, I, I honestly, I love you so much, um, you know, and thank you for your continued strength. And, you know, when... When you speak to your father, send him our regards and tell him uh, that we all love him very much. And inshallah, he will be our leader one day. Um, you know, going off that question, I do want to ask you, um, I have a couple of questions which are more legal related. So I'm going to ask Ahmed in a moment since he has a legal background and it's about the US. But I wanted to ask you, Arab, since you're here, you know, how do you respond to people when they say to you, um, you know, your father is a terrorist. Like, what is your response to that? Because that is one of the frustrating things is like, you know, um, you know, the repetition and you're right. Like some people are just very ignorant. They don't know. There's nobody telling them but what they've heard. And so sometimes it's that, you know, oh, your father's a terrorist. And so how does, it, obviously, it, you know, you're probably past the point of it upsetting you, but what, um, can you explain to me how you deal with that? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's at, uh, the most important thing is to look at the bigger picture, which is uh, to look at the Israeli court, okay? Because it's very important that uh, we all remember who uh, gave my father these charges and who gave every Palestinian these charges. It's the Israeli court. So they're, uh, you know, the judge and the prosecutor and everything. They, they, they have uh, uh, the rights to do whatever they want. And the other thing, you know, I, I, I keep giving facts about the Israeli court. In the last 56 years, more than 800,000 Palestinians have been arrested. And uh, a very significant percentage of them, they go into administrative detention, which is illegal by the international law, which is basically going to prison and getting three to six months, mostly six months of uh, imprisonment without any charge. And that's illegal by international law. And uh, because you don't go to court, they don't tell you why you're there. And uh, uh, what, what they do is that if they're not done with you, they can easily just uh, extend uh, the, the uh, six months to another six months to another six months. And people can stay there for years. And uh, the other thing is that 
It's very important to remember the staggering number of the conviction rate of the Israeli uh, court. 99.76% of Palestinians, when they when they go to, uh, to court, uh, they they are ruled guilty. And this gives you the illegitimacy of the Israeli court. Now, to go to, to my father's case in specific, uh, my father is a political leader, and and uh, the the uh, accusations for him, they, the, even the Israeli court has never said that that my father did anything with his own hands. They said that he planned. They said that he did this or that. But it's very important to understand that he's someone who led the student council and uh, was the founder of the Fatah Student Council in the 80s. He was very active in the uh, first intifada. He was exiled from Palestine for seven years. He was arrested before this time for six years. And he was uh, actually someone who supported the Oslo Agreement and someone who supported the two-state solution because he believed that the Israelis have gone to a point where they want a state for the Palestinian people. But in 2000, when he felt that we got betrayed uh, uh, by the Israelis, the first thing he did as a parliamentarian, because he was elected as a parliament member in 96, it was his role to represent the Palestinian people and to, to call for the uprising. And this is where he got uh, the uh, the label of, of the Israelis to be the uh, uh, engineer of the Second Intifada. Uh, because he called the people for the uprising and he never shied away from that. He never denied that he called the people to, for the uprising and he called the people to go for uh, to the streets and protest and all of that. Now, the problem is that without any proof, they said that he is the one who targeted uh, uh, what they call terrorist attacks against the Israelis. And uh, this is something that's not true because he's a political leader and he's, uh, he, he didn't have any role in that. And also the, the other thing is that he always argues that under the international law, you are allowed to uh, uh, resist the illegal occupation of your country. Yes, you are not allowed to target civilians. And he said explicitly that he's against uh, uh, targeting civilians, but at the same time, Inside the 67 borders, it's legal to, to uh, resist the illegal occupation. And the last thing I want to say is that we've had a, a UN expert, legal expert, who came and said, you know, that I want to just say it in, in one sentence, uh, that his recommendation, his legal recommendation, is that it's impossible to say that Marwan Barghouti was given a fair trial. And he gave many, many examples of that because they didn't have any proof against him. Uh, my father did, denied the Israeli court and denied having a lawyer even because he did not recognize the Israeli court and their legitimacy and their uh, uh, right to to uh, put him in court and in, in prison. And the last thing is just one example so you can understand the Israeli court. I still remember the first uh, uh, trial for him the judge said that, okay, let's start with the trial of this terrorist. So imagine a judge that starts a trial by saying, here is a terrorist and we want to uh, uh, give charges to him. So it, it doesn't have any legitimacy. So we always, Nancy, uh, uh, answering your question, we always uh, challenge the Israeli court's uh, legitimacy, which, which they have none. That's fantastic, 100%. Right, who is it that's trying them and, and labeling them what they are? Thank you, thank you, bro. And just real quick, there is a question from Lana. Uh, she said, when you tell us not to alienate people from the cause, are you also talking about Zionists um, or just people who are on the fence and misinformed but not personally invested? No, I, I mean, uh, for, I'm, I'm talking about the people that uh, are, are neutral, mostly, or or maybe they have uh, uh, some uh, sympathy towards uh, Israel and all of that. But the Zionists themselves, if they're Zionists, trust me when I tell you this, leave them alone, do not engage with them, do not interact with them because you're going to be wasting your energy, wasting your time. It's not going to go anywhere. They already have that mindset, you're never going to, to change it, but but do not give them the privilege of uh, evoking, you know, uh, something uh, that, that you say about the Israelis that they can interpret into uh, being anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish and all of that. So be very careful because they love uh, to, to use these, uh, these cards. Thank you so much. Um, 
let me see this. Maybe Ahmed can answer this. Just is there an updated list um online somewhere um where all the events that are going on in the US are happening? Uh, maybe Nikki knows as well. Um it says uh, first of all, I can't express enough gratitude from um eyewitness um and all the speakers today. Uh thank you, Alicia. Uh to Ahmed Nick, Sh Nikki, Shadia, uh, Jana, and Arab. Uh, is there an updated or ongoing list of rallies, protests in each city? So far, I haven't come across one all-encompassing list for the U.S. And here in NYC, I usually get my information from individual posts on Instagram. Um, if anybody, does, does somebody have a... Yeah, I could jump in. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you for the question. I think U.S. campaign, in addition to... You know, I've seen Palestinian Feminist Collective also do it. Um, I've seen Palestinian Feminist Collective do it mostly through Instagram. They'll develop the graphic slides with the different cities. But if you're looking for something also on the, the web, um, you can visit uscpr.org. You could click on the Take Action tab. And under the Take Action tab, you scroll down and, and there's a link to find a protest near you. But there may also be other institutions that do that. So please, like Nikki and others, if you know of of um, additional institutions or groups, um, please feel free. Thank you. Uh, I don't know about um, massive lists of actions that are happening. What I would recommend is that you plug into your local SJP or Solidarity Org um, by the city. If you're in New York within our lifetime, the SJP's um, Palestinian Youth Movement are all um posting and talking about uh, events that are happening in New York specifically and anywhere else that you might be um look for your local solidarity org and um you can plug in that way thank you folks uh, a couple of people put up websites to um where are we if americans new.org um of course for people to uh to uh, if they wanted to share information and i think that's specifically um uh, information for Americans may be easier to digest. <laughs> um, Wes, if thank you, brother. Uh, there was a question to uh, Julie Beer. Before October 7th, thousands of Israeli citizens marched in the streets against Netanyahu's government. Have they mostly now turned against Palestine due to fear or propaganda? Um, does anybody want to take take that? Nikki, you're up on the screen. You want to take that? <laughs> um, they've been protesting. Them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, they've been protesting Netanyahu. Uh, I think that they're still protesting Netanyahu. I remember the sort of abolitionist recall from a lot of Israelis has been everyone for everyone to release immediately the hostages. Um, I also feel like the um, genocide in Gaza has... Um, delayed or completely obfuscated the uh, trials that Netanyahu has been under for um, uh, corruption. Um, but I also think that uh, it goes beyond Netanyahu. I think that is a argument uh, that people like to talk about, that they support Israel, but not the Netanyahu government, as if the entire structure of Israel isn't actually predicated on the ethnic cleansing of all Palestinians. Um, and so I can't speak to the sort of political climate in Israel right now. Um, there are a lot of emboldened settlers that are raiding the West Bank um, that are not related to the government. That is just their legal status as settlers um, and that have military protection. So, yeah, I think what we're even seeing here in the U.S. with Joe Biden, like Democrats can't say that this is like a, a conservative response. This is just the response of imperialism and settler colonialism. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that, but I would say, yeah, it doesn't just boil down to Netanyahu. Um, everyone in his cabinet, from Smotrich to, to Avi Dichter to whoever, has been saying the most horrific genocidal calls. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if somebody in Palestine wants to respond to that directly. Just to make sure we're talking about the uh, protests uh, against Netanyahu right now. Yeah. But then, yeah, for as a nurse, I'm bad and I'm bad. I'm a little protest. Ah, but in no, 
من ال من اللي صار ب October seventh are they are they are people less um supportive of of a two state or a one state now are they like you know more Zionist yeah. because or are they fearful? So so what we know uh from the Israeli politics is that right now uh, Netanyahu is done uh, politically he knows he's done and uh, what we also know is that uh, the war or you know the genocide what what they call the war is uh, is the only thing that's keeping uh, Netanyahu in power because uh, um, Gantz is now uh, the, you know there, there are political leaders that uh, that have uh, more votes than uh, uh, Netanyahu the polls show and the polls show that there is a huge collapse in in the votes for Netanyahu in the next uh, government so everyone thinks that he will be out of power um also, we, we need to, to mention the fact that uh, Netanyahu proved that he doesn't even care about the Israeli people and uh, that his political uh, agenda and political ambitions uh, have, uh, you know, have way more weight for him than Israel and all of that. But at the same time, we need to realize that Netanyahu is, uh, has, has served the longest time as a prime minister in Israel's history. Uh, I mean, I still remember Netanyahu when he was six years old. He was a prime minister, and right now he's still a prime minister. And um, when, when, uh, but Netanyahu has never wanted a two-state solution, and he was very clear about that. In the 70s, when he was young, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s, he's never wanted that. And when he came uh, to power right after Sahak Rabin in the mid-90s, uh, when Sahak Rabin who is also our criminal, uh, but but he did want the two-state solution, uh, gave power to, uh, when he was killed by by the Israeli right-wing, Sahak uh, Rabin, uh, uh, Netanyahu came to power and he was very clear that he wanted to kill the two-state solution and that's where the tensions started. So I don't think that any uh, Israeli prime minister in the last, uh, uh, 30 years wanted the two-state solution except for Sahak Rabin and uh, Hud Olmert and this is why one of them got killed and one of them was put in prison uh, under uh, corruption charges which is Olmert but um, the, this is this doesn't change the fact that uh, this is something that they shouldn't be uh, controlling nor their decision. It's our decision and uh, the international the international community's decision. And I think that even with all the sacrifices, sacrifices and uh, and and uh, killing brings um, unfortunately brings. Uh, political uh, uh, solutions and political opportunities for political solution resolutions and we hope that uh, the israelis un can understand the uh, fact that the only way for their security is gi is giving the palestinians uh, uh, our own independent state and the end of the occupation and uh, withdrawing all the settlements and the checkpoints and the uh, 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 apartheid wall and all of that. Without that, they will never. They we will keep uh, going into the same uh, cycle. But yeah, the answer, the short answer is that uh, Netanyahu is politically done, but he's extending the uh, uh, the genocide so he can stay in power as much as he can until he solves his uh, corruption problems and not to go to prison after this. One hundred percent. I know. Thank you, Arab. I know Jenna, Jenna Jihad also wanted to add something to that. Um, yes, of course. I totally agree. But I also wanted to add something. It's not necessarily an answer. Um, just something that I have observed lately um, with uh, people talking about Netanyahu in, uh, specifically. Um, I, I've noticed that we've been using that colonial idea of blaming someone for, for the whole thing or like using the bad apple idea where like, uh, oh my God, Netanyahu was the worst. But then even if uh, Israel um, had a re-election and have gotten uh, the most leftist president ever, um, it is still going to be a colonial system. It is still an apartheid system. We should not uh, just stand against Netanyahu for his um, right-winged ideologies, but we should stand against the whole system as a whole. And this is the only way that we can eradicate apartheid uh, essentially from its roots and not only look at the uh, surface viewpoint of the whole issue here.
Thank you, Habib. Thank you. Um, this has been amazing. As always, we went over time. Um, we are going to cut it in 10 minutes. So if anybody has any more questions, please throw them into the chat. Somebody asked also where to donate to. Of course, I'm going to say <laughs> I witnessed Palestine, um, U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights. Everybody is doing different things. Um, you know, we at the beginning of this, you know, we were like donate to PCRF and Mecca and of course keep those donations going there. As far as the United Nations, we see that they are doing United Nothing. Um, and so I'm not going to recommend uh, people donate to them. Also, from the reports on the ground, is that people are not getting real aid. The United Nations gave toys to children, which were fake food. Who does that to kids that are starving, who are being starved? Um, and so, you know, when you do donate money, you know, like I said, people are literally going live, showing you what is happening on the ground. These journalists are showing you what aid they're getting and what aid they are not getting. And until we can identify those organizations that are getting aid in that is actually needed and that can actually help um, our people on the ground. I'm going to say definitely um, support organizations that are doing work like this. You know, we're going to keep trying to bring you people, um, educate. And of course, um, you know, we're working on a huge um, effort um, to get healthcare workers to Gaza. Um, and so, you know, it just, it depends where you want to, where you want to focus your support in. Um, and again, you know, as soon as, um, organizations are identified PCRF is bringing children they've already brought um, many children to the U.S. from Gaza that have been injured so I know PCRF's work is solid um, Middle East Children's Alliance they've also been working uh, with kids on the ground and they have staff stationed there and so we definitely support them um, you know U.S. campaign has been working tirelessly you can go to their website and see the work that they've been doing um, to you know here in the United States uh, which is also important work um, and so, you know, go to all these uh, different organizations and support them however you can. I just wanted to um, quickly jump in on that, um, in addition to what you just said. Um, I wanted to mention that, you know, there's been um, some centers in, in, in Gaza that have been, uh, obviously, that were located in Gaza City um, that have been completely obliterated. Um, one of those centers um, who's been that was partially obliterated was a, was a center called Palestine Children's Trauma Center. And um, another center, Delia Arts Foundation, which um, deals with, so the Palestine Children's Trauma Center deals with, uh, um, you know, children um, and adults that deal with, but, um, but specifically children that, you know, deal with trauma, PTSD. And, um, and so they, they deal with, you know, helping children um, in Gaza that have been obviously affected um, and also Delia Arts Foundation that is a center a music center um, that you know uh, provides uh, music resources for artists in, in Gaza uh, they've also been partially um, or it's not even known but they where they were located they're obviously guessing that it's been um, it's been bombed and and destroyed so um I, people have obviously been reaching out to me and asking me you know where can we donate because a lot of people are saying donations aren't getting in and we don't know where to donate to and this is and that but i think that now um the flow of um donations via in particular the red crescent that's what i've been told um is um one of the and pcr obviously but uh, is one of the um organizations that human rights organizations that are able to get um, you know, humanitarian aid. Um, I don't know, obviously, how much, but at least we know that the donations um, that are being sent to the Red Crescent, um, you know, are somewhere that we, I mean, the Red Crescent is just one, but so we're, we're organizing, there's a fundraiser that I'm personally organizing um, in London, and uh, we're raising money to rebuild, um, you know, to help contribute to uh, rebuild these centers in particular, like the children's, uh, the Palestine Children's Trauma Center and the Delia Arts Foundation. So, um, you know, these centers are really important as well. Um, and they are, you know, they are obviously taking like independent, I mean, like they're just taking donations directly to their center. I mean, to, to themselves to be able to, um, you know, rebuild the center and rehabilitate um, their spaces. but. So yeah, we have a fundraiser that is on the 8th of February. Um, so I'll be posting like 
like uh, links to how to donate um, to these to the Red Crescent and and other uh, medical aid for Palestine and and to these other centers. So I think it's really important to be able to to, to actually encourage people to still know that your your donations are still going to be used even you know what I mean even even if they're not being used now um, because humanitarian aid isn't allowed in or for whatever reason but once the, these organizations are ready to use these uh, the, the donations at least you know you've donated and and the money is there and it's ready um so anyway i'll be posting um information this week but um yeah there's there's many you know different um organizers that are organizing fundraisers um in in europe and in the uk who are going to be you know publicizing who exactly they're donating to and being very transparent with that and so people know where their money's going and how it's being used so i just wanted to make that point thank you so much Habib. so we are running out of time i'm going to quickly um just plug our next um webinar that we have it's going to be december 20th if you go to our website eyewitnesspalestine.org uh, we do have reverend mitri it's called life from bethlehem Christmas is cancelled in Palestine. And we will be joined by Reverend Mitri, who is the founder of Dar al Kalima um, Arts and Cultures uh, University in Bethlehem, and also with the Archbishop Atala Hanna, who will be speaking as well from Jerusalem. Um, so definitely uh, sign up for that webinar on December 20th. Um, the last question I'm going to pose uh, from the chat is for Ahmed. Um, Carla says, uh, we need help in understanding what specific moves would be most efficient in addressing our current uh, senators against ceasefire. They just voted two to three against sending a letter to the White House expressing a ceasefire. Yeah, great question. Thank you. I think uh, three quick thoughts, because uh, I know time is short. If, if folks are occupying these seats, we need to keep these seats hot. What I mean by that is we're keeping the pressure on these folks all day, every day to make these contradictions super clear, right? The masses are with the call for a ceasefire and more. So the very least they should do in this moment is call for a ceasefire to stop the genocide. And by the way, again, we've made it very clear the U.S. is complicit in this genocide. They are guilty in this genocide. They are part of this genocide. So if they are occupying these seats we keep these seats hot, and that's the pressure campaigns that we talked about, the calls, the letters, but it's also the in-office visits and, and so much more. Uh, let them know that those seats could have new bodies in them, right? None of these folks are elected for life. There's elections coming up, and these folks should know that, again, the masses, the electorate, the young people, the people of color, Jewish Americans, like, increasingly are trending uh, along with the Palestinian cause. And this should be a wake up call for all those folks who, you know, want to have those warm, cushy seats in Congress. Right. Um, so we should make that clear. And then, you know, I think a broad coalition is essential. If you if you notice what they're trying to do with some of these funding packages is also put like funding for the southern border, right, for the border wall. And for us as a movement, clearly we talked about standing against injustice in every facet with every oppressed community. And so there's coalitions to be built with folks along the southern border that are opposed to a militarized, Israeli-fied um, U.S.-Mexico border, right? So this, this broad coalition is crucial to our building. And then the last point, I'll just be brief again, making emphasis on a point we made earlier, direct action and civil disobedience. Folks continuing to escalate and put their bodies on the line will only continue to make it a more serious imperative for these folks to make that call for a ceasefire. Thank you um, again, Nancy. Thank you so much, brother. We are um, half an hour over the time. We really appreciate everybody's support. Um, again, sign up to our mailing list if you're not already signed up. Um, we will be sending out a list of all the speakers, their links, their organizations, and organizations that you can donate to um, to everybody uh, with a link to the Zoom uh, after this is over. So later today, you should be getting that email. Um, we truly appreciate everybody that took part, um, and we will keep bringing you these, um, these different programs, uh, webinars, um, with folks on the ground. So please stay uh, tuned, sign up so that you can get our emails and updates. I appreciate everybody that was on here today. Thank you so much. Um, and inshallah, you know, we'll be having a celebration webinar for a liberated Palestine soon together. Thank you, everybody. Peace and love.
inshallah. Thank you.